Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the name of the Lord. It's a pleasure to have you here in worship with us today. As we get started, just a number of announcements that I have for you. Um, I'm running those down. There's going to be an open house this, this afternoon for Esther Hopeland's 90th birthday. Um, they want to know us to know that the congregation was invited to that. Uh, in addition, preschool has some openings, so if anybody would like to have their kids or grandkids or neighbor kids uh, signed up for preschool, we do have a couple of openings that are there yet. Um, coming up is going to be Project Homeless Connect, which is a wonderful ministry which um, helps either homeless or near homeless people um, get connected with the services that they might need. Um, they use our church, uh, and as a re because we're centrally located in town, and because we have enough space in order to be able to do what we need to do. However, um, what we do need is we need a number of folks who would be willing to be navigators, which would be to kind of make your way around from place to place to get folks to where they need to be. They really like to get volunteers from our congregation because how many of you guys remember when you first came into First St. Paul's if you weren't a native here? and you joined and you had to figure out where you were going. You know what I mean? So if we have people that know where they're going in the building, that's very helpful. So if you could be a part of that, that would be wonderful. Um, the Frog Group is going to be meeting this afternoon, so information on that is in your bulletin. I want you to know that we have a softball game with our youth tonight, and I went to go see the last softball game, and it was marvelous. I want you to know that our kids there committed no errors. They allowed no runs in the last game and they allowed no hits because the other team didn't show up. <laughs> so anyway, put them on the victory again tonight, that would be good. And uh, last announcement that I have for you today is our associate pastor, Andrea Paulson, um, is going to be here. I think I let you know that her, she was planning on starting um, on, on July 12th. She has um, stated that, um, that, that she's kind of interested in having her welcome um, be that following weekend. I think that's the weekend of, what is it, the 16th, 17th, 18th, right in that area um, on that. And so, um, and so I'm thinking that maybe we'll have something like a congregational potluck because that's what Lutherans do when we get together, we eat, you know. So anyway, um, but kind of uh, watch your bulletins for other things that are taking place with that as well. For the congregation, please stand. Peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share that peace with one another. Amen. The opening hymn is hymn number 660. 
to obey you, and you favor us with true freedom. Keep us faithful to the ways of your Son, that, leaving behind all that hinders us, we may steadfastly follow your paths, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. to go to Jerusalem. 
and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Congregation may remain standing as we sing the next hymn. jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Right. Decided to go a different direction, though. Thought this one might be more helpful. If you were to entitle the sermon today, it might be, The Call of God is to Go, Not to Hide. But if you're wondering why I'm going to entitle it that way, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Let me see if I can start with a couple of personal stories. I remember, anyway, when I was in fifth grade, I was playing basketball for the Northview Elementary Pirates, ARG. Go Pirates. 
you know, we were pirates, so we were supposed to be tough. We were supposed to be unfearing. We were supposed to be, well, I don't know, you fell in the adjective on what we were supposed to be. But I remember not being whatever it was I was supposed to be one of those times because one of the first times that um, we ended up suiting up, and it was one of the first basketball games of the season. Since I was in fifth grade, it was one of the first times I had ever put on a uniform, and it was one of the first times that somebody ever followed me and I was heading to the free throw line. I can tell you how I felt with all of the people who were there, with the rest of the opposing team that were surrounding me, and with all of those people that were in the stands. As I was walking up to the free throw line, I felt alone. I felt afraid. I mean, what if I messed up? What was going to happen? Were people going to make fun of me? What was going to go? I don't really know why I felt alone or afraid. It was a home game, and quite frankly, most of the people who played on one side of the team or the other and the folks that were in the stands, no, nobody was really going to ridicule me if I missed or if I did anything like that. Most of them were my friends or my friend's parents, even if they happened to be going to another school. The people who were standing around me were my teammates, and they were going to be there and supportive. And quite frankly, whether I missed the shot or not, well, I was a fifth grader, and the sixth graders were starting back then, so consequently, they only put me in at the end of the game, and it didn't really matter whether I made the shot or not. But I remember walking up to the line and feeling afraid and alone. I, I can tell you another time when I felt like that. I remember being in high school, and I was, I was picked by my high school youth leader to be one of the individuals to preach at the early morning Easter sunrise worship service that was to be put on by the youth group of American Lutheran Church in Rantoul, Illinois. And I was only 16 years old. And there were going to be a couple of hundred people that were there. And I don't know if you guys know this, but one of the interesting statistics is, is that you know, many people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of dying. And so consequently what happened is, is that the idea of going up and climbing into that pulpit and starting to preach a sermon, well, I felt unworthy, I felt nervous, I felt afraid. I had never really done much public speaking before, and quite frankly, I had no idea. When I started to go up the steps, I felt alone, and I felt afraid. And I'm not really sure why, because I guess the key is, is that I've never really done much of this before. Because over the years, I have come to realize that when you are preaching in the pulpit, most people out there are rooting for you. Right? I mean, how many of you guys came to church today and said, I really hope the pastor has something good to say? You know what I mean? Nobody came and said, let's see if we can catch him up and then send him a nasty letter later on, you know? And, and most people out there are rooting for you, and they're not, I mean, so consequently what happened is, is that uh, didn't change the fact that on that early, early, early Easter Sunday morning, as I climbed the steps into the pulpit, I still felt alone and afraid. How many of you guys have ever felt like that before? Alone and afraid. You felt alone and afraid? Here's the deal. Maybe we felt alone, afraid, nervous, maybe scared, definitely. But if you've ever felt that way, you can not only identify with me, then you can definitely also identify with Elijah. In the Old Testament lesson for today, taken from 1 Kings. I think a couple of weeks ago, I actually preached a sermon about King David, and I talked about how um, one of the reasons that I really love Scripture is because um, the Bible tells us the whole story about all of our heroes. It tells us about all of their wonderfulness and all of their not so wonderfulness. It tells us about their you know, greatness and about their goof ups. And that's certainly true not only for David but also true with Elijah for us today. Now let me see if I can give you a little background of the story because quite frankly the one from the first Kings is, you know, Here's the deal, this is what's been going on. It's not like at this juncture, Elijah was new to the whole prophetic game. He had already had his share of times where he knew that God was going to stand beside him in what seemed like miraculous things that were going to happen. And he had already had his share of revelations. 
So let him know that he was never alone, that God was with him. Uh, one of the other times when Elijah had felt alone and afraid, he had kind of pulled himself up into a cave. And when he was in the cave, what happened was is that he thought, oh man, I can't do anything. I don't know what to do. I'm just hiding over here. And God had sent a, what was it, a, a whirlwind and an earthquake and a fire that went out before him, and then God spoke to him in a still, small voice. Anybody remember that story that was out there? So he had had that experience that was behind him as well. By the time we get to this text for today, Elijah has already taken on the prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel and ended up you know, challenging them to kind of a duel on whose God was bigger and whose God was greater and whose God was true, and it had already been confirmed that Elijah had defeated the prophets of Baal and they had been ashamed. They had been put down. They had been proven false. Elijah has already then run in the food that was provided for him for 40 days and for 40 nights. But after Elijah has done all of those things, King Ahab and his wife, Queen Jezebel, which all of us would recognize as being bad because if anybody doesn't like a woman now, they call them a Jezebel. They had decided that they had had enough of Elijah and that they were going to seek his life to take it away. And so Elijah felt alone and he felt afraid. And once again, he hides himself in a cave. And he has this prayer, and the prayer goes like this. Just kill me now. He says, just take my life away. Basically, he says, if you do that, I'm, I, I want to be done. I want this to be over. I don't want to be afraid anymore. I don't want to feel alone anymore. Let's just get this over with. And I suppose, I suppose Elijah had some right to be afraid. I mean, Ahab and Jezebel could raise an army against him. But I'm not sure that he really had the right to feel alone, because certainly God had proven that that was never the case for him. Anyway, God answers Elijah's prayer in the same way that God very often answers our prayers. He doesn't answer Elijah's prayer by granting his request to die. Instead, he answers Elijah's prayer by proving to him that he's wrong that he is not alone in this struggle and that he need not be afraid even if there are things out there to be afraid of. Instead of God saying, die, God says, go. Go on your way to Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Aram. And then you shall anoint Yehu to be king over over Israel, and then you shall anoint Elisha to become the prophet who will eventually take your place. What that basically means is, you think you're alone? We're going to get two kings on your side to take on the one that's against you, and we're going to get somebody that can stand beside you who's going to take over, but you're not done yet. But you won't be alone, because there will be somebody right there with you for the rest of of your ministry. So let's take a look at what this means for us today. This is not just a recitation of a bunch of things that happened a long time ago far away. I would argue, no, that's not the case at all. I would argue that instead this is an example of something from which we can learn. First of all, if you have ever felt depressed, if you have ever felt alone, if you have ever felt like you were afraid and that you can't go on and that you just want to be done, then I want you to know that God's probably going to answer your prayer not by saying you're right, but instead by giving you a further mission. If God doesn't want us to hide, God wants us to go. And if we go and do what God calls us to do, we will very likely find out that there is a Haziel that's willing to stand beside us, and there's a Yehu who's willing to stand beside us, and there's an Elisha who's willing to stand beside us to prove to us that we are never alone no matter what we're going through. 
The other thing that I would say that I can learn from this is that, um, and in, this is in contrast to our society teaches us today. I, I remember growing up, and what my society taught me to, to, to believe was that my feelings were true. You guys been taught that? Don't deny your feelings, your feelings are true. Here's the deal, your feelings are true. If you've ever felt alone, that was true. If I've ever felt afraid, that was true. If Elijah ever felt like that, that was true. Your feelings are true, they're just not always accurate. They don't always reflect reality. Elijah felt like he was alone, but he wasn't. And while he might have had reasons to fear, he didn't see that there were also reasons to hope. So my advice to you is simple. Go do what is right in this crazy, mixed-up world. Even in the midst of crazy presidential elections and Europe having Great Britain leave the EU. Instead, don't focus on those things. Instead, tell people about the faith. Help the poor. Instead, find ways to encourage other people who are trying to do what is right. Instead, teach your kids or your neighbor's kids to do what is right, no matter how they happen to feel at the time. Because they just might find out, like I have in my life, that there's a whole congregation that's behind you, that there's a whole auditorium of people who are behind you. You might just find out that there's not only Haziel and Yehu and Elisha that are willing to stand next to you, but Elijah also found out that there were hundreds, no thousands of Israelites who were willing to stand with him as well. So, no squirreling yourself away. The call of God is not to hide, but it is to go in the midst of a crazy, mixed-up world who definitely needs to hear what we have to say. I would invite you to stand as we sing. The hymn is, Here I Am, Lord. <laughs>
words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated for the offering.
Yeah. Because I go to Grand Island every once in a while. If I stop and saw you every once in a while, would that be okay? Yeah. 